Thank you for going through that exercise. Um, that exercise asked questions that were not commonly taught, not commonly the course materials within this department. And I recognize them as a challenge. But I did provide a great deal of latitude with range estimates. And I'd like to share with you some of the results from elsewhere. This same quiz has been delivered worldwide for the sake of training software engineers in the task that forms the focus of today's session, software estimation. Estimating how long tasks in software development will take. This quiz has been delivered worldwide to leading software professionals and newcomers, to those who are architects and those who are code monkeys. And this is the distribution of results that has been done. You are asked to provide with 90% a range between a low value and a high value such that 90% of the time the true value would lie within that range. You are asked to choose a range such that you're very confident, with 90% confidence, the, the actual value lay, lay somewhere in there, even if you didn't know what it was. And so it was with those who answered these questions. I gave you 10 questions. If, if there was correct fulfillment of this request, that 90% of the time the true value would fall within there, the average score we'd expect, certainly the most common score would be 9. What do you find 9 out of the 10? What you actually find is a very different distribution. Um, the most common number that people get correct is 2, which is, um, which is not far from where it is here. Um, actually, in this class, <coughs> students on their the way towards uh, program yet on their way towards programming virtuosity, um, at the most common number it's one. No shame there. That's the second most common number. You know, the second most highest point in this distribution for professional programmers crafting the software you use every day. It's, it's not unusual for people to get a zero, right? Three or four, nine? Almost never. Almost never. What's going on here? What's going on? Anyone? We're not good at estimating stuff. We're not very good at estimating things. And can you unpack that a little bit more, Evan? My perspective on it is if you have more knowledge in a specific field, like for example, the Alexander degree question, I mean, you kind of have experience to rely on, so you get a lot tighter of a range yeah. than you that you have. So, like the sun question, but I think most people probably like, I don't know, I never. Even. Yeah. So, so experience just helps you estimate, I guess. Experience can help inform the estimates. And Having really like disparate like kind of topics. So. Yeah, that's that's true. Um, Having expertise that can't give you the exact answer, but narrows your estimates also raises some risk that the actual, you, you don't know what the actual number is, and you, but you're very, you, you know, you have a great deal of knowledge in this area, and you may make the estimate a bit too small, so you're off by a dozen included. So there's a bit of risk there if you make it too narrow. With a broad enough, I mean, uh, Habib's idea, um, excuse me, it was, it, was, it was not Habib, it was the um, uh, name of the gentleman next to you. Uh, okay, Ab Abdullah? Hibba, Hibba. Hibba, okay. Um, observed that you could make this very, very large. And actually, I was thinking maybe one or two people would, would just say, what the hell, you know, zero to a million for the temperature of the sun, and, and it would have fallen within there. Um, uh, but evidently there wasn't over erring on that direction. So I want to talk about a couple key take home messages, riffing on what was said earlier. We're dangerously poor at estimates. Dangerously because we are called to task for our estimates long after we've given them. Months later, we may be called to deliver on them working long hours, long nights, under a lot of stress, because we gave estimates that were off base. And we're, we tend to be off base 
in a certain direction. It's not that we're off base in no direction. We tend to be, as it turns out, overly optimistic. There wasn't really an optimism notion in these. You know, there wasn't like we hoped that the air, the weight of the large world's largest blue whale is larger or something like that. Um, but we tend to be over optimistic about our own abilities. How long it will take for us to develop something. We tend to downplay how long it will take. And we tend to be, as was the case here, too confident about our answer. We give range estimates that are too narrow. Too narrow. And we, we flatter ourselves into thinking we know more tightly what it is than we actually do. And both of these are big problems. One's a problem where, where we tend to, to overcommit. We tend to um, say it's going to take less time and we're called to task for that. And the other is, you know, we're, we're too confident. So even when we communicate uncertainty, it's too, it's too tight. Um, so in, in short words, we're in accurate way that's systematically dangerous. Um, I'm going to introduce a distinction here between guesses, targets, and estimates for, uh, for es in the software regime. Much of what we gave here varied between, on the one hand, estimates and the other guesses. But um, within, as a practicing software professional, you want to be clear about what sort of answer you're being asked to, to give. Estimates should be made by the technical team. One of the most dangerous things is for an estimate to be given by a manager who's not a technical person. And to say, you know, I think we, the team can deliver by here without consulting the team. And challenges should be made at the cost of expending political capital to challenge those estimates. Um, so you have to resist pressure to set estimates optimistically. There is a lot of pressure psychologically within our heads to esteem ourselves uh, competent, to avoid being judged as slow by other developers, but also pressure politically often for us to deliver things sooner. Why is that? Why, why do stakeholders want us to deliver things sooner? Yeah, they, they want to get the goods, right? They, they want this thing to be developed for their organization, so they're going to be wanting you to promise it sooner. They're going to want to show it off for that company gathering, that annual company meeting. They're going to want to get it underway so they can, you know, uh, get get uh, credit within the organization for having having uh, commissioned this project and brought it home. And there's a lot of pressure often to deliver things sooner than the technical team is necessarily comfortable. And so you have to learn to resist uh, that pressure. One of the keys is to use range estimates, but you, to do so, and I don't know if we'll get to this today because of the limited time, you have to deal with the phenomena we noted today. These have been 90% range estimates. We would have expected an average count, single most likely count would have been up here eight or nine. And instead, it was way down here, you know, starting at, at three. We tend to give estimates that are too narrow, range estimates that are too narrow. We flatter ourselves of how much we know something by giving estimates that are too tight. Um, so using range estimates is a lot better than just giving a number. It communicates uncertainty. It communicates when we're worried about how long something will take. If there's a, an edge case that, that might push it out for a long time, it communicates that. But we have to be careful to give range estimates that are sufficiently wide. And, um, and one of the key principles is, ladies and gentlemen, we tend to be horrible at giving estimates for large blocks of work at once. If we're told, how long will it take you to develop this timeline project? And I'm looking for person hours for that. And if I had asked you that at the beginning of the term, you would have given me a count of person hours for the functionality to be delivered in ID5. And I would argue that that, that count, if you had been asked to, to think about that project just as a whole, give me a, a count, it's going to be way off, typically. By contrast, 
if you decompose the task logically into different pieces, into its different constituent parts, you make the effort task, you know, let's see, we've got to do this and this, we've got each of these four types of markers to have, we need a, a way of importing data and, and, and perhaps uh, some way of selecting the axes, um, we need to be able to select which date, uh, date column to use and what date format. We've got to implement this for real numbers as well as calendar dates. Once you start thinking about specifics, we can often get much better at estimates. It's not that the estimates will be great, but they'll a lot, be a lot less bad than if we just estimate the whole thing together. We say, what the heck, you know, it's going to take this many person hours and often we throw caution in the wind and we're just way, way off for that. So we're much better if we break things down into estimates rather than doing it for the whole task together. Okay. So why do we do estimation? Why am I giving a talk about this? Why is it important? Well, it turns out it's extraordinarily important for countless companies, countless organizations, um, those commissioning projects. Look, we need ongoing estimates of, you know, how much time and effort, money is going to be needed to develop something. And to decide whether it's worth going forward with this project at all, or when to go forward with it, to assess the level of risk involved in the project, to plan when we can roll out certain features for a, a web service, or to roll it out uh, for a new software product. Um, we need estimates. We need some estimate. If we have multiple systems, think about something like LibreOffice or Google, Google Docs and Sheets and so on, or think about Microsoft Office, all these different pieces, and somehow they have to make their way to be finished at comparable times so they can be released as a group. So you can release LibreOffice 5, or you can release Microsoft Office 16 or whatever. Okay, um, so Estimates are absolutely key. And, you know, look, even in your sprints, right, you're, you're trying to get a sense of balancing the work between different people. You want to get a sense that, that you're not giving too much to any one person. And so you, you want to have some estimate of, is this a big piece of work or is it a small piece of work? I want to make a distinction between guesses or wags Sure. And forget the language, but wild ass guesses. Um, so it's like, what the heck? Um, it's, you know, I think it'll take this. Um, and an estimate. And an estimate can be defined judiciously as like it's an honest, realistic, serious assessment of how much resources and time is the most common one in software. Uh, securing some objective, some set of functionality, quality, scope. Um, will require. You remember I began this class with the Iron Triangle, right? What are the three corners of that triangle? Cost, time, and that's really what we're focusing on today with estimates. And some say quality or value. Um, the last the last estimate, you know, sometimes you'll see it with scope, sometimes you'll see it with value, sometimes you'll see it with quality. Okay? Um, but you can argue that both of these play a role in value, and so I often you know, will phrase it with value. Um, so estimates here are a, an attempt to give a thoughtful assessment of how much, in, in this case, time would be required to obtain a certain objective. A target describes some desirable goal and, and it may involve a, a time estimate or a time guess to get there. You know, we have some target. We'd like to be able to ship this product ideally by year end. And it's a target. It's something we'll shoot for. It's something we'll aim at. But it's it's not an estimate of how long it will take. It's just, it's a motivational, aspirational goal. We'd like to be able to do that, okay? A plan is something different. It's, it's you know, how will we go about doing that? Who's gonna do what? A work breakdown structure, uh, cost breakdown, etc. Okay, so I wanna give a few key considerations. 
So software engineers are very poor at this thing. Particularly, and this is a key point, particularly for larger and less concretely described pieces of work. So if I again say, this timeline project, how long that will take? The estimates you give for that will tend to be vastly worse than if you were to think about each piece of it, estimate usually less and total it up. In both cases, you get some estimate for the total thing. But in one case, it's on the basis of its constituent parts. It's different sub-pieces and thinking about each consciously. And the other is just, well, you know, it's the whole thing. You know, maybe some guess um, for the whole thing. So, so we tend to be very poor at these more aggregate um, estimates. Now, estimates tend to have, for psychological reasons, strong optimistic bias. We tend to err on the side of promising it too early. Which, it turns out, is the dangerous side. If we promise it too early and people build their expectations on that, they can be grievously disappointed. If we say it's going to take longer than it actually is, and we actually deliver it earlier, people will not be disappointed. They'll often be happy. Okay? Um, now, another key point, though, so, so there's an asymmetry in how bad it is to be off in one direction or another. There's another hard truth I want to share with you, ladies and gentlemen. If you look at the literature on software projects, the literature is rife with failed software projects, <coughs> failed or, or problematic software projects. In this course, I used to have students uh, read, a, actually it's 470, read a book called uh, Software Runaways, which was about software projects going bad. You know, sort of horrendous projects that took five times as long as they planned and, you know, caused all sorts of problems. But a lot of what, when we say a software runaway, we say a project is out of control, or we say a project is, is you know, way over time. We have to be careful, because you have to ask, against what standards are you judging it? Who's the National Bureau of Standards who is establishing what's over time versus what's adequate time? If a project, a project, same project may be judged a success if you give an estimate that's a little too long and you, you deliver early. Same project, if that same manager gave an estimate that was way too optimistic, so a fraction of how long it actually took, it'll be judged a failure, it'll be judged a runaway, it'll be judged you know, out of control or, or a way over time. So you have to realize that software projects, their very success is often judged by a yardstick, which we establish through an estimate. It's our estimates that come back at us to judge whether or not we've succeeded in this project. So far from being just a number, it's a number which is used to judge whether we've delivered successfully or not. And therefore, it is a number of great gravity. And a key issue in this line is who's conducting the estimate? All too often in software, the actual estimate does not originate with the technical team. And there's many reasons for this. Perhaps the manager is a bit of hubris and it's not from technical background, but things, uh, you know, I think we can do it. Given the team I've got, I think we can do it in this time, kind of judging from past projects. And they give a so-called estimate that's not an estimate. It's a, it's a kind of commitment that's a guess, but it's not a really a judicious estimate, considered estimate. In other cases, a technical person is asked to give an estimate, but they're pressured. It's 
kind of like, okay, when is this project going to do? Going to be delivered? And you say February, and your manager says that's too late. We need it by Christmas season. When, is, when are you going to be able to deliver it by? Well, maybe we can do it by early January. No, no, that's too late. It has to be done by Christmas. When are you going to deliver it by? And there's this pressure that's put on to the technical manager. You gotta get it done. And you know, the technical manager's thinking, well, maybe we can cut corners in this, and maybe not do this technology, maybe accumulate some tech debt in, in this feature. Maybe we could, maybe we can hire one of those folks we interviewed last week and bring them on board and we can get some extra traction. And their mind is racing and they're being pressured to give an estimate, an estimate that's in line with the, what the manager wants. And they end up giving something that's not a considered judicious estimate of how long it's going to take. It's kind of like, uh, what's, the, what's the earliest date I don't know it can't be delivered by, as Tom DeMarco talks about. Um, so a very a key point here is, is needing to resist the siren call. That's, that's Evan's nice phrase. I like it very much. Of, uh, of changing our estimate. Um, according to sort of pressure. Okay. Um, and critically, we need to avoid our estimates turning into commitments. And one of the ways we do that, one of the ways of saying preventing the number we give from being turned into, okay, I'm going to judge you by that, is not giving a number. And what do we give instead? A range. We say, well, you know, it could take two weeks. It could take two months. And that opens up the conversation. What do you mean it could take two months? Well, you know, we really need to prototype something with this new technology we're thinking about using because we don't know. It communicates uncertainty. Um, it, it gets a conversation going about what's needed to narrow that estimate, that range estimate. Giving a single number is enough. It's like giving the rope they'll hang you with sometimes. So Tom DeMarco, um, in, his, uh, in his book, I believe, Peopleware, um, says, look, the common definition of a software estimate is the most optimistic prediction, most optimistic prediction that is a non-zero probability of coming true. In other words, you, you give <laughs> you know, about the most optimistic thing that you, you don't think is a complete fiction. You say, well, I think I can do it by then. You know, like, I can't rule that out, and you, and you end up giving it. Um, and as he says, look, except if you accept this definition, if you go down this path that leads towards this method, what's, you know, what's the earliest date by which you can't prove you can't do it type of, of situation? Um, uh, that quote is, is elaborated on in, in this very book that asks you about the weight of blue whales. Um, so there's three basic dangers of optimism and estimates. We're optimistic. We're overly optimistic. Horribly over-optimistic. I see it in myself. I see it in my students. I see it in the professional software development companies I've led or the teams. It's all around us. Why is that? Well, there's a couple, a couple key things that, that contribute to this danger. Love. I've, I've labeled them here three really salient features. One is, it turns out that if you look at how software projects, if you look at the amount of time that they take to complete, it's not a nice, normal distribution, amongst other things. It, it doesn't go to infinity on either side. There's no negative delivery of projects. It's not a, it's not a nice bell curve, even. Uh, with a zero, if we do zero, if this is time to completion of the project. It's not something like this. What do you want? What do you think it might look like? Turns out it's skewed, and it's skewed in a positive direction. It has a very long tail going this way. 
there's, well, projects are not going to succeed in less than zero time. Right? They're not going to be delivered. But projects can go on and on and on and on for a very long, for a very long time. So it tends to be skewed in, a, in an asymmetric way. It's skewed in a positive direction. Some projects take a lot, 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 lot longer than the median, or than the mean. So that's one problem. Yes? Should it be skewed to the left or skewed to the right? Taking longer time to complete it. Yeah, so should it to the left be on the right or on the left? No, it should be on the, uh, as it's drawn, because um, this, this, the mean may be like here, but there's, there's a very, there's a, quite a number that are like way out here, way out here, way out here, way out here, way out here. Whereas in this side, it's comparatively tighter. You, you bump up against this, but up here, it's, it goes very far out. Yeah. So it tends to be, you know, I'll, I'll, if I want to emphasize it even more, it might look like this. Uh, so it's, it's, it tends to be compressed here, but stretched out here over a long direction, leading to a mean, the average, that's much larger than the median, the, the value where 50% is to the left of it. And so this is the median here. Um, median. Um, 50% is, is there, and 50% is way out here. Okay. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and so it's skewed way to the right. Okay. Um, so that's one issue. A second issue is, is asymmetric risk. This is another danger. The consequence of being too optimistic is simply much worse than the consequence of being to pessimistic. Why is that? Why is it that being too optimistic is a problem? People talk about wanting people to be positive, um, you know, a life of optimism. So why is there a problem here? Yeah, so, so uh, I think I saw a Masonian hand first. You might lose your job right. if you say it will take too long because the publisher or whatever would say you're incompetent. You can find someone else who can do it in a small amount of time. Okay. So, so people fear that. Um, so if you look at the distribution of risk, though, it turns out that the risks are actually much worse in terms of the consequences of, of overpromising, of, of being overly optimistic. schedule whole plans like within a company. So, so they expect maybe your system to be in place by you know beginning of the year, rolled out over the holidays, um, and a large scale rollout across the system so so that all the tax work for um, you know for the fiscal year that has to be done by end of March can be done in your new system. And suppose you're three three months late. Your system's not even delivered until the beginning of March. They are screwed because they structured their whole workflow around using your system, and it's not in place. And they're trying to use the old system, that, but they weren't counting on using it, and therefore they haven't really updated it accordingly. And and people are building their 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 assumptions, their cutover plans, their workflow around something which is bitterly disappointed um, around about when they get the system. If you tend to say too late, there is a risk. It's not zero. As Mason said, there's a risk here. But um, the risks tend to be more gradual in character. Um, and if you say, oh, we're going to deliver two weeks earlier than we expected, often you'll be greeted by a smile. If you say we're going to deliver two weeks later than expected, you're unlikely, ladies and gentlemen, to be met by the same smile. So 
So it turns out that there's an asymmetry. It, it pays to be risk averse, but we tend not to. And finally, there's psychological tendencies. And there's powerful psychological tendencies that Mason referred to, actually, erring on the side of being optimistic. So here's, the, here's an asymmetry. So this is from a real company. Project line. Days for the target completion date on the, on the x-axis. This is the target. This is what they're shooting for. Not, not actually an estimate, but it's a target. Um, so it's, it's a less, uh, less of a commitment. Um, and rising number of targeted days to target. And the y-axis is actual completion date. What would it mean if a value here, so a, a, a plus indicates, the center of the plus indicates a project came in that was targeted for its x location came in at that y location. So what would it mean if, if a plus fell on this, on this um, sort of uh, 45 degree line, this, this uh, place where x equals y? What would that indicate? Yeah, um, well. Their estimate was exactly correct. Their estimate was exactly correct. Case in point, right, take a look at this one right here. They estimated about 100 days or they, they targeted 100 days, and they brought it home in 100 days. Bang on. The expectations were right in line with what was delivered. Can't fault that. Is there an asymmetry here? Is there something that that is a pattern that comes out and strikes you? What, what's, what's a pattern that comes out and strikes you? There might be a couple of them. I oh, will speak again. Yes. Nothing is below that line. Yeah. So what's okay? Nothing is below that line. So what does that mean in intuitive terms? Nobody is ever sort of giving more time than they need. They're always yeah. They're always at best giving themselves the exact amount. Of yeah. So no one's delivering sooner than they target, right? If if there was something which targeted a hundred days and it actually took less, it would be it would be somewhere down down here. And there's nothing on the 100-day target line that, that gives an actual less than that. In fact, there's nothing anywhere less than this. And so no projects are coming in less than their target date. Are any coming in over their target date? Are any? How many? Yeah. Yeah. Is it a little or sometimes is it a lot? <laughs> okay, so so let's let's take a case in point, right? Um, let's take uh, these ones here. So these this this trio, right? It was estimated to, to finish about thirty. Uh, the, sorry, the target was about thirty days. How long did it actually take? Somewhere upwards of one hundred twenty. If you're feeling butterflies in your stomach, <laughs> I share your sentiments uh, as a fellow software developer. Um, how about these? Estimated to come in in 20 days. Yeah, we can do it before, before the holidays. No problem. No problem. Okay, so this was estimated about 20 days? Took about 230. Oh, um. Been there, done that. Um, how about this one? Uh, five days. Yeah, we'll get it done by week's end. Two hundred seventy. Uh, well, we had to upgrade the OS, and and then the HDMI port didn't work, and the adapter gave out, and we had to order a motherboard. And, um, if you recognize some of your experience here. It's not without reason. We're all in this boat together, ladies and gentlemen. But the, the, the side of it is unmistakable. We're never delivering things in less than our target. And often, it's grossly above our target. Grossly. Like many times. Like orders of magnitude sometimes. I mean, these are like things that we thought might take hours. 
and they took 120 days. Um, you know, I can get it done before lunch, and then, you know, uh, in March you're still still working at it, right? Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I think I could get it done before Easter. Um, yeah, so there's an asymmetry here. There's an asymmetry between, you know, what we're promising versus what we deliver. What side is it on? And there's an asymmetry in how skewed it is, how far out it is, right? Um, very few are coming in less than we think and, and some, you know, crowded way out there. And as we said, I mean, it's, it's often a lot less bad to, to overestimate than to, to underestimate. Why is it we have a psychological tendency to optimism? I gave, I, I gave three sort of major reasons here. Asymmetric distribution, you could see it here. Asymmetric risk, it's often we get dinged much harder. The people come down on us much harder. We get a lot more frowns if we're off in the direction of saying it's going to take longer than I originally estimated rather than it's going to take less time than I originally estimated. Asymmetric risk. Asymmetric psychological tendencies cannot be overstated. I mean, th these are fundamental. Um, well, why do we estimate too little? Well, I, I argue that there's many reasons for this psychologically. To some degree, we want to keep a high self-image. We, you know, we, we think of ourselves as, as high productivity people, and we like to flatter ourselves and think we can do that soon. Yeah, we, we can knock that off. It's, it's, it's easy. Um, another reason is, is competition. You know, we've got a bunch of people looking at us at our group meeting who we know include some hotshot programmers, some, some very talented folks, and we're being asked, how long does it take to do this? And I don't want them to smirk at me. I don't want them to snicker. I want to show I can stand on my own and, and I can deliver. Maybe I'll have to work pretty hard, but I can do it. And, and so I, I give an estimate that's somewhat low. I know it's low. I know it's over-optimistic. I'm saying it's going to take less than, than I, I think it could easily because I don't want to seem like the slowest one in the bunch. Or maybe it's appeasement. You know, we're afraid that the manager will be unhappy if we say we know they're really counting on getting this soon, and we know if we if we tell them the bad news, uh, we, we tell them it's going to take a long time, they'll be disappointed. There's low there's low immediate impact adversely if we give an underestimate. If we give an underestimate, what like in the short term? We go pretty much on escape. The manager's happy. Team's fired up, maybe. We're, we throw ourselves into the challenge. A lot of energy, a lot of enthusiasm to deliver on this, and a lot of people in the company around us are happy. That may not last, but it's an immediate sort of pull in that direction. Um, we have a lot of sort of enthusiasm for the results. It's really easy to give a wild ass guess for a lot of things. I mean, it's really easy to pull it out of your pocket um, and, and present it. Um, pull it out of a hat. Uh, all too easy. And finally, it's really easy to neglect many factors. There's many factors that we commonly leave out of estimates. Some of them are here. We don't conceptualize. Look, um, people are going on vacation. People are burnt out and they need a bit of, of, of time off. Uh, people have personal commitments at home. They're going to be away for travel. They've got to take care of this ailing spouse or this, this parent that's sick or child that's sick. But there's a lot of technical issues we often forget, too. You know, uh, The time to engage in data conversion from the old system or to cut it over. The mentoring time for new team members. The ramp up time for them to get up to speed on, on committing. The creation of test data for it the work to integrate different components, the time required to, to coordinate around a new test or, or give information up for performance tuning or, or defect correction, those bugs that take a lot longer to find than we anticipated. A lot of our times, our estimates just don't grapple adequately with these. Um, and communicating with the client is one of them, I'll note. 
Yeah, Will. I'd also say that one of the major ones in a lot of projects that have a lot of different moving pieces that have their own estimates is yeah. not accounting for other people's estimates being inaccurate. Yeah. Because a lot of the time, Good. you have an estimate that's, that's here right. and then it keeps getting pushed back, and then your thing keeps getting pushed back, and something else gets pushed back. And that's right. And it's, it's a cascade effect. And my estimates are built on your estimates, and your estimates may be over-optimistic in part because you're counting on someone else's, and so, yeah, it ripples through. Very good point. These sort of systems effects are, are, are quite pervasive. Um, other, other things, you uh, six days, training time, holidays, vacations, these things called weekends. Um, these things are easy to ignore. Um, you forget the fact that some of our suppliers are working from the States, and guess what? Thursday is Thanksgiving. And what that means in the States is typically they're unavailable from Wednesday till Friday through you know, Monday. Um, and we're not going to be able to count on getting this fix in place or this defect resolved or this, uh, this issue clarified by them. Yeah, Mason. Exactly. Exactly. But to do that granularity estimation, you're kind of designing the thing a priori. That's right. You, you're thinking through the steps, and you're thinking in concrete terms, what do I need to put this together? Hopefully, you can reuse some elements of those plans to, to plan out the tasks, right? And those turn into many milestones, which, you know, Will could put in into, the, uh, into Trello. It's something to accomplish. But you're absolutely right. You have to think mechanistically about like what are the pieces that are going to go into this. Not not just the, the the artifacts, but like what steps do you need to go through to bring it together, and and then to be asking how long will this take or that one, and that forces you to engage at a very concrete level of thinking. Like who's doing it? How up to speed are they? What tools do they need? Do we have those tools in hand? Um, what has to be fixed to, to let them go forward, et cetera. And as Will said, that may get into issues of dependency because they can't do that until they're done with this other task. Or they can't do it until this person is available to help them and that person's on vacation or on their honeymoon for the next two weeks. And it gets into very concrete sort of scheduling issues, uh, which we may have time to discuss in, in coming lectures. Um, so, you know, often we create a, a checklist uh, for, for an estimate. Is it clearly defined? Does it include all the kinds of work, all the functionalities? Is it broken down in enough detail to expose hidden work? Um, you know, is, is it approved by the person who will actually do this work? Um, and the productivity. Another uh, checklist that, that might be used that I'm going to recommend is, includes actually more than two. It's more than a range estimate. Includes a best case, a worst case, and a most likely case. This is key because you communicate uncertainty. If a manager hears just one number, they have no clue about how uncertain you are. If they, if you at least have a range, it will indicate if you think it could go really long. And a range, most likely, together will give a sense that maybe it's really asymmetric. There's some cases you're worried about. Most likely we can do it three weeks, but it may take three months. Um, and, and it gets it again the discussion on in a constructive way. What does it take to lower that uncertainty, to lower that risk? What, what will you need in order to be more confident? Um, okay. So as Mason referred to, the key for providing one key for providing better estimates is to go through a process that's termed um, by men, including companies here in town, as decomposition. Um, it involves taking what could be a fairly large element of work, as initially described, and systematically parsing it out into pieces, into its, its, its natural steps that are needed for it. So we break down what, what's needed into a set of particular tasks in our minds, 
and then we estimate those. Okay. Um, so we're we're breaking down this kind of big notion of this into its its smaller pieces, and often um, this ends up serving other purposes as well, like uh, thinking who's going to be working on each of those pieces, or thinking through. Um, uh, what are the, the steps that need to be in Trello as many milestones, etc. And this fosters much better estimates. We're horrible at estimating big things at once. It's a wild ass guess, typically. Um, but if we break it down, we have a much clearer conceptualization. We think concretely about who's doing it, how long will it take, what's involved, and there's some cancellation of errors often for the different pieces, okay? So, you know, we might have different features, and I should remind you a little bit about some of the things you give us each milestone. How long did you estimate? How long did it actually take? And what's the, the raw error? The point here is, you're not just glomming all these together into one an estimate for this whole bunch of stuff. You're, you're breaking it down, estimating how long you think each piece will take, and comparing it against the actual. Good practice, and one that over time might refine your notion of how long things will take, help you better calibrate it. Um, the, so this is a best practice, and it's best practice applied here in town by software companies. But that's far from the solution by itself. There's several problems. One is optimism. Um, and the study here has suggested that on average, developers tend to be too optimistic by 20 to 30 percent. And the tendency is for them to give their kind of best case estimate rather than the mean or the median. Um, and so one of the best ways to compensate for this and by itself, it's not full compensation, but it helps, is to provide range estimates. Rather than providing one number, like this, you provide a range. And that range communicates uncertainty, and the range helps us also think through what could go wrong. Right? I mean, just like decomposition forces you to think in more granular level, a more concrete level, what are the different pieces of work that have to be undertaken? A range estimate forces you to think, how, how quickly could it take and how long could it take? What could go wrong? What could happen that throws off my estimate? And how long could that delay things? Right? And it tends to give a more considered sense of, of how long things might, might take. Okay? Now, one of the best practices here is to give these ranges, or ideally best, worst, most likely, in ranges that have a certain degree of confidence. But as you saw today on this board, we tend to give ranges that are too narrow. We say 90% range, and it's actually, it's actually something more like a 20% range, or 30% range. Um, so, so we have to go through a process to correct those ranges. Okay? But range estimates are really good at forcing us to think through optimism and pessimism. Maybe forcing us to ask, has this been pinned down yet? Or have we really demonstrated that this can, these two can work together? It forces you to think in short about what the risks are and which of those risks have been adequately dealt with to this point or which could be dealt with. It forces you to clarify things sometimes. Um, so range estimates are very good. They force you to communicate to the client uncertainty, which is really important to set expectations. They're not holding you to one number. You did warn them. Maybe on average, you think it will take two weeks, but it could be as long as three months. And if you're working on this six weeks from now or two months from now, 
you can remind them, as a developer, you told them there was that chance it would take longer. Um, but it may also be that they empower you to pin it down much more tightly by allowing you to do spike prototypes or, or, or bring in a developer with a lot of expertise in these sort of issues, etc. Um, if you give a range estimate, it also makes clear it's not a commitment. Right? If you give one estimate, it sounds like a commitment. Yeah, I'm committing to getting this done in six weeks. You have my promise. I, you know, I'm, I'm backing this up. I'm going to get this done uh, six weeks from now. But if I give a range estimate, it's harder to interpret that. It's like, well, it could be in this range. And, and there's not a commitment being given for when it will be delivered by. And that can be good to set expectations in addition to communicating that uncertainty. Over time, the irony is we have more and more confidence about how long it will take, but there's less and less we can do about it to make it less, right? We're more and more locked in to it. Okay, um, there's a whole set of methods which Given the need to cover additional materials in this course, I'm not going to hold you responsible for But you should know that the literature has extensive documentation, including this book, for how to work with this. To go from range estimates or three-point estimates, like best, worst, most likely case, to compensate for our tendency to to um, have two narrow ranges. And the basic idea here is that we end up, we end up um, adjusting for or uh, compensating for by growing our ranges. Okay? And these techniques provide a principled way of doing that and provide a principled way of going from number, range estimates from small pieces up to range estimates for the whole that are uh, realistic and that take into account our over-optimism and estimates at the same time they, they're not absurdly wide in terms of you know, assuming every single thing goes bad or every single thing goes as good as possible. Um, and there's some statistical elements to this that I'll share with you um, and I, I will post this. Just bear in mind, uh, you can find versions of this lecture and other versions of this class where I go through this in detail statistically, and I'll see if I can point you to some of those if, if anyone's interested. I'm not, not going to hold you responsible for it. But the basic idea is we correct for the overly narrow ranges, and we can then try to, um, to compensate for our, our ranges being too limited to narrow, to construct it. This combination of range estimates, ideally these three point estimates, that are compensated together with the need to tell managers uh, always a range rather than a, a single number can go a long way towards shielding us from these things. The final component is decomposition going in and systematically taking apart each thing we need to do and thinking through what is required to do this, who might be doing this, how long would it take given their other commitments, given the dependencies involved. And finally, and something that might be covered in the coming lecture, uh, there's elements of scheduling. And it's to this that Will alluded. We have dependencies. We have this depends on that, it depends on that. If Joe is late with their component, Mary's going to be delayed and Sue is going to be delayed further from that, and it's going to ripple through when we need to, to grapple with those, those components. Okay. So I'm going to close my formal lecture right now because we are over time. And I hope you dream not too heavily of blue whales and uh, uh, book publication list, but I actually want to get a bit of guidance before I leave the room. Um, 